interruption. Um, all right, here we're going to click and go live. Click. Not what you expected. And we're live. It is Sunday, January 10th, 2021, 5.01 p.m. And joining us from Statuary Hall, the newly cleaned up Statuary Hall at the Capitol is uh, Representative Tom Malinowski, uh, who is, among his many other distinctions, the only member of Congress ever to have made a video about me in Urdu, uh, in Hindi, uh, with uh, 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 Arnold Schwarzenegger, who of Wait. course looms large today. Um, Tom, are you? How are you feeling? And are you? Are, I assume you and all your staff uh, uh, were safe uh, and not nobody was injured on Wednesday or nobody was uh, 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 traumatized beyond what we all know? Yeah, so my staff were not here. I was, I was in the house chamber in the gallery when all of this took place. So I experienced it from my vantage point. The members uh, are all physically fine. As you know, we lost a Capitol Police officer. Uh, we just lost another one, apparently, to who took his life um, today. So I'm I'm actually here because uh, a buddy of mine, Representative Dean Phillips from Minnesota, and I just wanted to come by and uh, and say thank you to the Capitol Police officers who are still here on duty, just to let them know that we think they did everything individually that they could uh, in those horrible moments. So let's start with those horrible moments. Um, although before we do, we should say that we are not allowed to have fun anymore. And uh, in lieu of fun, we have Tom Malinowski, um, which is the way we always introduce the show. But in lieu of fun on Wednesday, uh, you guys had really a pretty dramatic uh, and deeply anti-democratic moment. And I want to I, I want to start with just like what was what happened to you that day? I mean, you did an interview in the middle of it, but like walk us through. You were on the House floor doing the electoral vote count. And what happened? Yeah, so I, I was up in the gallery watching the debate on the first challenge to the electoral vote and. We, we, of course, knew about the demonstration. We knew that crowds were gathering. And so I went kind of in and out, looking out the windows just to see what was up. And I have to say, I came back and uh, reassured a lot of nervous members of Congress who were sitting with me that, you know, yeah, there's a big crowd, that this is a fortress. There's no way they get in here. Um, we were reassured that there was a plan uh, for this, and it just did not seem possible. And yes, so let me let me stop you there because uh -huh. the day before this happened, I, Steve Vladek and I were talking on in Lua Fun, and we made exactly the same yep. point that there uh -huh. is, you know, the Capitol has a police force of twenty two hundred people. The uh, you know, people can say they're going to storm it, but storming it and actually saying it and doing it are very different things. And the Capitol Police Force is no joke. And um, uh, people are likely to have a very rude surprise if they try to actually yep. come into the building. Um, what went wrong? We underestimate the threat, Ben. Even those of us who've been warning about it underestimate it. You know, I, I, I've been screaming about QAnon for some time, led the resolution that passed in the House condemning it. Um, watching this building force of, of white supremacist extremism and terrorism in this country, and, and even I am guilty of thinking in those moments of, you know, this is America and we don't have insurrections in this country. We, we have security problems, but not, not this. And obviously, there's a much deeper cultural problem in in parts of our law enforcement community. I think the FBI is waking up to this, but um, certainly the Capitol Police was not awake. Um, National Guard, uh, Army, uh, even D.C. Police, which should know better at this point, um, 
that that these people actually mean what they say. And you know, that's a that's a common historical mistake when we don't take people's words at face value. Um, so I think that's the problem because we could have stopped this had 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 the security presence been sufficient. Absolutely. And right? They weren't but even they, wearing white riot gear. They weren't. No, it was a First Amendment activity. These were supposed to be protests, and and you know maybe this is. And I and I remember thinking in the middle of it, like maybe and this is absolutely horrible, but okay, maybe this is the kick in the ass that we need to recognize that. These aren't just protesters that you cannot, like, you know, the, to put it in the same category as Black Lives Matter protesters is not only offensive, but it is just disgracefully, um, it, it makes us vulnerable because we're not prepared for something that is of a completely different order. Uh, these people have been radicalized over several years to believe that, um, they, they have to take the government of the United States by force. They believe it has been taken by force by, you know, the deep state cabal, blah, 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 which, which is the, the theory propagated by QAnon and a million other conspiracy theorists, but unfortunately validated, validated by the president of the United States and his enablers in this body. And to see the looks of terror on their faces as they gradually comprehended that this thing that they have unleashed is now trying to lynch them, to kill them. Because the, the you know, the mob is even is more angry at the Republicans than they are at us right now. Right, because they um, know, because you're not, you're not pretending not to be a lizard person. <laughs> yeah, so we're not, you know, they're the, tra you know, Lindsey Graham is the traitor. Uh, and Mike Pence is the traitor. The worst of them all because he didn't do his job on Wednesday according to them right. and um, so there's a lot of fear in their ranks based on that but look this is this is this is a serious and deep problem I just had a conversation half an hour ago that shook me you know I said we were going around talking to the Capitol Police officers and we we met one officer who seemed pretty shaken and he told us that uh, he's, he's also in the uh, Army National Guard and that he'd been up with his unit, uh, I guess, the last couple of days, so after Wednesday, and that members of his unit, including NCOs, were, were telling him the whole thing was fake. The whole Wait, thing at the before, Capitol. This is before, before it happened no, or after? after. This was like yesterday or the day before. And like, you know, the, the election was stolen and this thing was staged. It was an inside job. This is in his unit. The speed with which you go from 9-11 to 9-11 truthers now, it's mm -hmm. like radically accelerated. Yeah. yeah. So I have a question and I was going to ask you about the National Guard, but now I think you kind of took us to this place of like, envisioning the the chamber and what it looked like while all of this was happening and i'm very curious what you think what did you notice a difference or have time to notice a difference in how people reacted who were republicans who had um who had supported um this type of if there was a dip like what how were was there a difference in party and how this was splitting or was everyone united and being just scared for their lives? <laughs> yeah, they were no everyone was scared you know when they're banging on the doors. And yeah. so what, yeah. what happened to you guys? The, eventually they are banging on the doors and um, and you guys are inside the chamber or yeah. in your case, in the in the uh, in the gallery, a bunch of people were in the gallery. So what happens then? Yeah. So. The first thing we see is. Uh, uh, Speaker Pelosi, Majority Leader Steny Hoyer, they're suddenly taken out of the chamber by their security details. There's no announcement. There's just somebody whispers to them and they bolt. And then they start shutting the doors with us inside, which was a odd experience. Um, and Capitol Police Sergeant at Arms kind of frantically running uh, in every direction, uh, you know, shut that door, get that door. Where's the key? They didn't have the keys to some of the doors to lock them. And um, there are gas masks uh, under the uh, the chairs in 
uh, in the House uh, chamber, so we were asked to take out the gas masks from the box. These gas masks uh, have a Who's mechanism. Who's doing this at this point? So, like, Sergeant at Arms. Okay. No, there's no. So it's Capitol Police, Sergeant at Arms. Okay. And, you know, so we get announcements from the Sergeant at Arms in the room, you know, take out the gas mask. They, they have a mechanism that makes a kind of siren sound because, uh, you know, it continuously blows air uh, or takes in air. And so suddenly there are, you know, a hundred little sirens going off in, in the room. And we're told to put them on. No, no, don't put them on. Confusing instructions. And then the house chaplain gets up to the microphone and starts praying, which created, for me at least, an atmosphere of ship going down. And yeah, then... It's sort of the yeah. imminent doom moment. That's right. And she was a wonderful person, and she was doing her job, trying to... <laughs> trying to calm us, I think, but uh, anyway, wow. and then, That's like um, a very, oh, I hadn't heard that. That's... Yeah. So the, and then, and then they, they direct us to exit by at least, you know, again, we're in the gallery. So chamber for the floor, the gallery, slightly, you know, different levels. So we're directed to a particular door and turns out the opposite side of where people were Riders were trying to break into the speaker's um, lobby where the woman was shot. So they were pushing us, they were taking us out the other way and then down the elevators to the basement. And we were from there taken uh, to one of the house office buildings by one, one officer, just one officer, maybe 50 members in my group. And he had no idea, he was improvising. And we, we ended up in a cafeteria and then that didn't seem safe. So then we went to another uh, big room, committee room, where we spent the rest of the afternoon. So how plausible is it from your point of view that this situation could have ended up with a whole lot of members dead? Uh, I mean, I'm, not, I'm not being yeah. morbid here. I'm, I'm, although the question is inherently morbid, I'm actually trying, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, we ended up with five dead people, um, uh, and none of whom are members. Uh, and so people kind of think of it if they don't think of it like you're like the Capitol policeman's national guard unit does as a, as a fraud, you know, as a bad security breach that was managed, right? How close were we to a situation with a significant, uh, um, a significant casualty rate among members of Congress. Yeah, it didn't, in the moment, it didn't feel like it was that close, but the more I learn, uh, the more I see this from every vantage point, not just my own, it, it, it feels like it, that was very close. Mm -hmm. um, you know, most of, if, if, if there were a lot of people carrying firearms, they were not openly carrying them. Some people, of course, were arrested with firearms, but there wasn't a lot of open carrying of firearms, but they had clubs, they had bats, steel, metal poles, and they were absolutely, um, they were there to go after people, not after things. You know, you see these statues here. They weren't going after the statues. There's, there's very little damage to the, you know, the, the physical um, and symbolic infrastructure of this place. And I think like the psychology of these people was, we're not here to destroy the house or the Senate. Yeah. We're here. We're here to, to hang Mike Pence. The, we're here to hang Mike Pence and Nancy Pelosi and the traitors who are voting to end Donald Trump's presidency. Um, it, so yeah, if they'd gotten a hold of Pelosi, if they'd gotten a hold of anyone they recognized, or, or perhaps anybody wearing, you know, one of these member of Congress pins like I've got here, then, yeah, sure. So one other um, tactical uh, sort of situational question. Um, when, at, 
at what point did you understand that it was over? And so I was very surprised that they allowed Mike Pence, for example, back into a chamber that was, you know, they hadn't swept the facility. They hadn't um, like at what point did you realize that it was over and how confident were you that it was over? Yeah. So we were getting reports, you know, we, we've gathered in what seemed like a secure location, except for the fact that the QAnon caucus was there not wearing masks. So today we got a notice from the house doctor that everybody should be tested. Oh God. Because these guys and gals were just thumbing their noses at us when we said, you know, you need to put on your mask, but we were in a, you know, indoor room together for hours. And um, I don't know, by late afternoon, we were hearing that the building is clear, um, that it seems secure, that they just need to double, triple check. And, you know, from the very beginning of this, I, I and others, uh, every chance we had to speak to uh, the speaker, to Steny, uh, the message was we are going right back into that goddamn chamber the moment the blood is wiped off the floor. We have to finish this. The most important thing is to show that this gets finished tonight. And there had been, a, you know, originally there was some thought maybe if we don't finish by midnight, we adjourn until the following morning. No, we're going to stay here until it's done. And so, and I know McConnell felt that way. I know, you know, virtually every sane person felt like it was essential that we go back in. Um, as long as we know everybody's out of the building. Do you think you're going to see, or we're going to see, you said that you've been shouting about QAnon um, for, for the last couple of months. I think that like there have been, you know, We've had Kathleen Ballou on the show, and she is a histor an incredible historian um, of this movement and like white supremacy movements and conspiracy theories generally. Are people going to start taking this seriously as a threat? Are you going to see people? I mean, it just seems to have that like everything that people feared seemed to have finally have happened, and there has to. I, I don't know how. It, member of Congress lives through what you've described today and gets up and says QAnon's not a threat. Let's leave up their platform. Let's let them keep saying these things. Let's keep doing this. And so I'm very, like, I'm curious what you think. I, I think, I do really believe this is a wake-up call that we needed. And, you know, it could have been much worse. So I'm grateful that if I'm right about that, that this is the wake up call we needed, that it wasn't a much worse one. I, I sense that among a lot of members who now are just like, what can we do? Sign me up. Now, as I said, that, there's a, there's a it, QAnon how, caucus how, here, right? How, par how partisan is that? I mean, is that a, the Democrats who are saying, you know, and Adam Kinzinger who are saying, it, sign me up? Or is there a significant group of Republicans who are it's uh, more uh, on board with that. Yeah. Well, you saw the vote in the Senate, right? They ended up, they ended up mustering only six votes. So, so this has gone. I think. Yeah, the, but you guys had a hundred. Yeah, I know. So I'm saying it's it's further evolved in the Senate than it is in the House. Uh, but but we have dozens, I would say, Republican members in the House who are at least struggling with this in their minds, in their consciences. That they're, and and sometimes they lose that struggle. You know, there's a really amazing. Um, story uh, told in, I, I think, an op-ed in, in a Detroit paper today by a freshman Republican congressman from Michigan, a new one, who completely, I mean, I don't think he and I would agree on almost everything uh, we're talking about. And he describes a conversation with a colleague of his, a Republican colleague, after the siege, when we're back on the floor to vote on the certification of the election. And he says, his colleague said, I know this is wrong. <laughs> I know that Biden won and I've got a constitutional duty to certify this election, but I'm afraid. Um, 
my, I'm afraid for the safety of my family right now. And so I'm going to vote to support this challenge. And it's a, it's a really telling story because that, that, I don't know who that is, right? But that member knows what Q and that member knows this is bullshit, right? And that his party has been taken over by people who are scary. It's just that he's scared of them and not yet willing to stand up. Others, I think, are willing to stand up. Um, but it's dangerous for them because, I, again, as we were saying, the, the, the violent threats are now more likely to be directed against Republicans who are perceived as traitors than, uh, than Democrats. So as all of this is unfolding and we're watching it, from the outside and seeing everything that's happening and not hearing things and having no idea, we get this statement from the president, this recorded statement. And I don't know that I've ever seen something quite so chilling. And that's, we, I think we all know that after five, six years, that's saying something. It was just a, it was a pretty, um, it was a pretty stunning lack of statement statement. And, um, and then, you know, there was a huge question about um, whether or not he had incited this to begin with, especially given the speech that he kind of gave, which was like, well, go down to Congress. And it's like, you don't tell, you know, there, I, I don't know how you get, how people have gotten to a place where they're even like marginally defending that given the context of what this group had said that they were going to do and what they wanted to do. And so just, I mean, what was it like to watch the president's statement and where were you when you watched the president's statement? I didn't watch the president's statement. Lucky. I you. don't, <laughs> I don't know. I, I don't care. You know, I'm, I'm so past beyond hoping that he says the right thing. I think it's pathetic that there are people who still think, okay, maybe with one week left, he'll say the right thing. Give me a break. He's behind this. And, you know, I did see, I think, some excerpt of it on Twitter, and it just, it struck me, I mean, it, it felt like a hostage video. Yes. And, and every one of his supporters, like, understands the difference between Donald Trump standing in front of that rally and saying, we're going to the Congress now. We're gonna show them or what he tweeted beforehand when he said, be there and be wild. They know what that means. And, yeah. and they know that's the real Donald Trump, not the Trump who is forced to sit in front of a camera and read those words. So I don't care what he says. I care what my Republican colleagues here say. I care about what other Republican leaders say. This is on them right now because this is a monster. This is a beast they have been feeding and it is now going to feed on them. And they need to either stand with us for self-protection or they're going to see that Lindsey Graham was right. And they're going to be destroyed. I don't use so that kind of language normally, but look, this is the moment we're in. So let's talk about Lindsey Graham and uh, his ilk, which uh, let's define loosely as people who knew better. We know they knew better because all through 2016, they told us they knew better, who then signed up for whatever reason and are now shocked that there are mobs following them through airports. Um, so they're different from the Josh Hollies and the Ted Cruz's of the world because they're not... Uh, Although Ted Cruz has an element of this, of course, because he was warning through about it all through 2016. But they're not 100% uh, on board anymore. They seem to have an awareness that, you know, the uh, plant with drip that eats blood that they've been feeding blood is now wants to eat them. Um, how should we understand the Lindsey Graham caucus at this point? Yeah, they're scared. And I think they're scared of two things. They're sort of caught in a vice, a, a vice of, of accountability from both sides, right? They're scared of the, the, the monster on the far right, which they, they fed. And as I said, is now going to turn on them. And look, it's not just a political threat anymore. It's not just they might get primaried. It's a physical threat. Yeah. And at the same time, they're also scared that Lindsey was right when he said, that if we elect Trump, we'll be destroyed and we'll deserve it. 
Uh, and so all this stuff you're hearing from them about, oh gosh, we have to be unified now, we have to move on. And, you know, Marco Rubio tweeted out today, went after Biden, like, oh, you know, Biden could have risen to this occasion, but now it's his fault that we're not unified. It, you know, all of that is, is pure, pure fear that in fact, they may be held accountable for having been on the wrong side of history for the last four years. And they're scared of the righteous fury right now of mainstream America that is seeing the consequences of this presidency. And, you know, we may be directing it, that fury primarily at Trump and Holly and Cruz and, you know, the, the, the idiots who are running this challenge to the election. That's not Lindsey Graham. That's not Marco Rubio. But inevitably, like, yeah, you know, they're not going to get their book contracts. They're not going to be able to get their jobs. Um, they're worried about that. And so they're trying to define that kind of accountability as somehow wrong, preemptively. Is so there, let me, oh, sorry, go, go ahead. ahead. Go ahead. I have one last, uh, just before we kind of pivot um, a little bit, I was going to ask you about that a little bit more, which is kind of like, so if there is this kind of this, this um, lizard, anti-lizard people, um, like, like minority to inherit that like the Republicans are weirdly and strangely fighting over. You have to think that the feasibility of that and the power of that control is going to be a very poison pill at like at this point. Like, and that is one of the only benefits of what's happened coming out of Wednesday, uh, which is that there is like if you are that there mainstream America and even those in the conserv uh, even conservatives and people on the right have decried anything having to do with this movement and that like maybe that's a great thing for for our political scene right now maybe it's something that really needed to happen um yeah i think it need you know i I'm, I'm afraid something like this probably did need to happen for for that shift to become possible and we're still not sure if that shift is really going to happen right it's a, there's a war within the republican party we see it here every day I don't know who's going to win because there's millions of people out there now who believe this, this crazy nonsense. But I, I, I think there is a chance now for um, Republicans with integrity to stand up and say, this is not the party that, that we want. And, you know, by the way, when I say that, it's not in my political interest for that to happen. If I were purely partisan, I would want Donald Trump to lead the Republican Party all the way through 2024. In my, in my suburban middle of the road district in New Jersey, you know, I'd be more likely to be reelected if I get to run against that yeah. forever. But it's, it's just, you know, it would be much better for the country if folks like Adam Kinzinger are the future of the Republican Party, even though, you know, somebody like that would probably do better in my my neck of the woods in New Jersey. Well, we'll worry about your neck of the woods in New Jersey in 18 months. Um, uh, um, so I want to talk about like we've talked about last week. Let's talk about this coming week yeah. and the week after we're seem to be on a fast path to an impeachment vote. Um, from your point of view, is the primary significance of the impeachment vote, since it's not to remove Donald Trump from office, uh, since he's out of office in nine days anyway, and that's, you know, is it primarily A, to disable him disqualification from further uh, holding of office and honor and trust under the Constitution. Mm -hmm. B, the, uh, as a restraining set of brushback pitches for the nine days that he remains in office, you know, to caution against self-pardon or against a mass pardon of the uh, people who did this, etc. Or three, uh, a symbolic uh, statement of congressional uh, line drawing, or from your point of view, is it all of the above? Uh, what's the pro what are the what are the values that an impeachment vote, from your point of view, is serving here? Yeah, I was going to say for all of the above. 
I think. In, you know, in roughly most, what order of priority? I, yeah. It depends who you talk to, right? For me, I think it, the most important thing is just drawing that line that Trump has been erasing. I, I just, I, you, you have to have a statement that this is unthinkably wrong. And yeah, I supported the last impeachment, but this is, come on, like the president of the United States instigated a, a violent assault on the United States Capitol to stop the Congress from doing its job. If that's not the most impeachable offense, I just... It's kind I, of the definition of it the is. impeachable unbelievable. offense, right? It's, it's unbelievable. Like, it's like when we think of where impeachment comes from, um, I mean... In the minds of the founders, they would have thought about Charles the first, right? And what was Charles, who was impeached, tried, and executed? And what was his crime? His crime was uh, 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 waging a war against the legislature. I mean, that was literally the crime. Yeah. Um, and <laughs> um, you know, and so like this is pretty damn close to that. So yeah, that's for me. That's that's the main thing. I you know, we've got to reestablish respect for norms and laws in this country. We have to reestablish some sense of stigma for people who do these things. And this is the tool the Constitution gives us, so we should use it. And there are other things. You know, we've got the Twenty Fifth Amendment, and Congress actually there's a way for Congress to initiate that process by. Uh, appointing a, a body, a commission, to meet with the vice president to make that determination. We, we could choose to do that and impeach him. Others have proposed uh, 14th Amendment uh, resolution that would basically declare Trump to have been an insurrectionist, as you know, under the 14th Amendment. That would disqualify him from further office. And, you know, I, I think impeachment is the cleanest uh, and most appropriate uh, response, I'm willing, you know, to all these Republicans who are like, oh, no, don't impeach him. That would be divisive. My, my response is, okay, what would you do? And, and, and the answer can't be nothing. The uh, otherwise, answer cannot be, cannot be nothing. Cannot be nothing. We pointed out to them that we did not impeach Richard Nixon because Republicans went to the White House and convinced him to resign. So I'd be fine if they went to the White House and convinced him to resign. You know, be my guest. You can take the lead. But the answer can't be nothing. It can't be he shot a man on Fifth Avenue again. Right. And yeah, a, lo a you, lot of people have been shot on Fifth Avenue at yeah. this point. And, and they are. And I've heard this argument from them on the House floor in private conversations many times that, yeah, you know, we know it's bad. It's bad what he's doing. But if you confront him directly, he gets worse. And, and that they've been, they've been arguing that for four years. And you know what? It's just gotten worse and worse and worse because they have failed to confront him. And now I'm, I'm done with it. They're going to so have Kate's, to confront him. Kate's got one more question, and I'm going to start bringing in audience members to ask uh, their questions. Uh, that means they're going to flash up briefly on screen. Don't get distracted when they do. Um, so I, well, I was going to actually ask, um, where I want to ask about inauguration and like what the plans are for safety around inauguration and what people are thinking and how people are feeling about being able to attend the few events that are going to be in person. Um, but I also kind of just wanted to follow up on what you just said, which is kind of this idea that I've been wondering about, um, which is that why is there kind of this, this amount of. Sorry, I'm getting distracted by people popping up on screen. Um, why is there this amount of kind of, um, it seems like this collective action around still not pushing for Trump to be impeached? That just seems like it would, I just, it seems like a very clean, very not divisive. If there's like, I just, I'm not quite seeing it. It seems as if people are going to get dragged down in the, in like, in the in the treason aspects of this of the, the treasonous and seditious aspects of like everything that happened on Wednesday and I'm a little surprised even though as like I know like firsthand like people are just like leaving the White House in droves and resigning in protest why is that like 
I just wouldn't want to touch this mess with a 10 foot pole. Um, do you think that the faction has grown to such an extent that they already people feel their power so much that it's not safe to leave? Not safe to leave. Like safe what? to leave kind of like that, like to, not safe to vocally un, like express the, the fact that they don't support the president when they are QAnon or they're not like not in QAnon, but like they're, you know, that they're just that they're in these parts of the Republican Party. Yeah. That you I said it's divisive. Like why? Like this is crazy. Well, it's, <laughs> yes, again, some of them, it's the physical fear and political fear of the Trump base. But as I also tried to suggest they're they're scared that the stigma is going to attach to them. E even if they weren't out there uh, riling up the crowd, there were a couple, by the way, and I'm, I'm going to be introducing a censure resolution against a uh, congressman named Mo Brooks from Alabama, who was actually yes. at the White House. And, and he literally said to the crowd that was about to march on, on the Capitol, it's, it's time that American patriots start taking down names and kicking ass. So, you know, that's like direct incitement. But but even the ones who just, you know, they just supported Trump for four years, they're scared that the stigma is going to attach to them, that we're going to, you know, that this, again, righteous anger from mainstream America over what happened eventually attaches to everybody who was on the wrong side of history for the last four years. What is that going to mean for them? And And so they're I think desperately trying to change the subject this week away from the the insurrection, yeah. the violence, the assault on Wednesday to, to, to unity. Unity. Didn't Biden say we should all be together? And I think, that's I think that's coming from a place of fear. And by the way, I love I love Joe Biden's emphasis on unity and overcoming division. This is not where I was a week ago. But it, it can't be unity. It has to be unity around respect for law and not. And, and yeah. unity can't be at the total expense of accountability. Right. So and party party unity is much different than like, you know, like the national like, unity. Yes, exactly. Like this is I mean, like deciding that, you know, your party unity is uh, greater than your like your I don't know, your loyalty to your government. It's like that's a big problem. So, um. Before we uh, hear from a concerned citizen who has a question specifically about this, uh, about the process of censure and expulsion resolutions, I just want to quickly ask you, how concerned are you about the security of the inauguration, given all this? You know, I'm concerned. I'm not qualified to give you an assessment, obviously. I am qualified. We are all qualified to be uh, hearing what these people are saying, which is yeah. that they're coming again. This is an ongoing assault. This was not just one day. It was not just Washington. It was a lot of state capitals. So uh, there's no question that we have to be ready here and elsewhere. I'm reasonably confident that the inauguration is going to be treated a lot differently from uh, January 6th. There, there's going to be both the defense is going to be stronger and this is more important. The offense is going to be stronger. The fact that that the FBI is 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 now aggressively pursuing the people who came to the Capitol on January sixth. That keeps them on the defensive. Right. Uh, we're, we're I think people are now actually reading social media, not just you and me and us, but like law enforcement. And so, you know, I I think it's going to be uh, we're going to be vigilant. It's going to be okay. My attitude is. We are going to be here. We are going to get this done. We are not going to be intimidated by any of this. That's again one reason I'm here today. I just I some some members I think needed to be away. I needed to be here. I needed mm -hmm. to be in this building. And that's my attitude towards inauguration. Tell me where it is and I'm gonna be there. No, I think it's a All great right. message. Uh, Thank so you. we're going to go to we're going to go to audience questions um, so that we can get as many of them as possible. Please keep your questions brief, uh, succinct and to the point. Concerned citizen, the floor is yours. My question is about Leader McConnell saying he won't take up impeachment articles until the 20th. Do you think that's a gamble? On his part? 
Yeah, on what? In whose part? On his part? Yes. A as in, do you, do, do you? Mm -hmm. I, I'm I'm trying to cl let's clarify the question. Do you mean? Are you asking whether he's trying to slow walk it, or what? You know, whether whether it's a tactical position on his part, or whether or something else. Do you think it's dangerous for him to wait? Oh, okay. I see. Yeah. I see. Okay. Thank you. Well, I wish he wouldn't wait. Obviously, I think speed is of the essence. And, and I'll, I'll tell you, I've spoken to some, some of the Republicans who are in favor of impeachment. And there are significant, I wouldn't say significant numbers, but significant people in the House Republican caucus who would like to do it. And I think they would be a lot more comfortable doing it quickly here if they knew that the Senate was willing to quickly take it up. Um, so McConnell probably knows that and, and he knows from our last experience with impeachment that the longer uh, he waits, the more the Republican base has more time they have to work on their members to, to uh, get them, to give them cold feet. So I think that's probably what he's thinking. David Plus they Box. get to make and they get to make the argument, oh, well, Trump's gone, so why are you impeaching him? Yeah, I'm, I'm really not looking forward to that argument, by the way. If they don't move quickly on this, like I think the momentum will be lost, and it's terrible, but yeah. Thank you, Representative. Can you please discuss for us the process for both the House and the Senate to expel members who foment, encourage, or support sedition, as well as voter disenfranchisement, and can it be a secret ballot? Oh, that's an interesting uh, no question. To my knowledge, it can't be a secret ballot. There's no secret ballot ever in this democracy. A, like we're yeah. supposed to sign your our, name to things. Yeah, our constituents are supposed to know what we're doing here. That's the Part essence of the of, argument against yeah. anonymity and free speech and like the yeah. First Amendment. Yeah. Um, right, because I'm supposed to be held accountable by my voters for how I vote. And um, my, my understanding, look, it's not something I've had to think about until very recently, but you can expel any member with two thirds, a two thirds vote. Uh, but there's also a process that some have raised with us. And I don't, again, I don't 100% understand it, but the 14th Amendment to the Constitution does bar from uh, offices of trust and responsibility people who engaged in insurrection against the United States. This is obviously, this was done to prevent people who fought for the Confederacy in the Civil War from serving in Congress in the future. And so the, the argument has been made is that we have a mechanism uh, by a majority vote to declare that a certain people, perhaps President Trump, perhaps a member of Congress, engaged in that act of insurrection. And uh, that would be a bill, as I understand it, that the president would have to sign. The president will soon be Joe Biden. So it, 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 I'm not saying we should do it, but it may be something that's, that's available to us. It's a, uh, and it's of course an option that does not require, presumably the question of whether the activity is insurrectionary is from a judicial point of view a political question uh that's an that's an interesting question but it wouldn't require a two-thirds vote in the senate as would convict disqualification by means of conviction correct and and i you know i would be careful like i know there are people who would say that if you voted to not to certify the election then that's an act of sedition or insurrection and I would not go there. I'm furious at those people, but I think we have to be careful in using these nuclear weapons that, yeah. that we have. Um, I, I would want to see evidence that a, if it's a member of Congress, that that member specifically explicitly incited the, the assault and the violence against the Capitol, against other members. But yeah, in that case, sure. All right, so for this, this uh, next question requires a little bit of background for the audience. Before Tom was uh, a member of Congress, he was the Assistant Secretary of State uh, for uh, uh, Democracy uh, and uh, Labor and Human Rights. Uh, um, and uh, this question relates to that. Uh, Christopher Argerus. 
Hi, Tom. Um, my my father uh, grew up in your district, and uh, I, I told him you're coming on tonight. And he said that he went to, to Jonathan Dane High School with some Malinowskis, but I probably don't think they were relatives of yours. Considering they were not. That, yeah, you were an immigrant. Um, so yeah, my as Ben uh, alluded, uh, my my question has to do uh, with um, you being the former DRL secretary um, and. So the, this insurrection of the Capitol would have been something that you would have routinely condemned had it happened in your native Poland, Hungary, or Iraq. Uh, how does our friend Tony Blinken or the next secretary for DRL credibly speak to uphold the rule of law abroad with the specter of another backslid of democratic values at home in the U.S. by a subsequent administration? Yeah. So look, we got to be, he's got to be, and I think he will be brutally honest about our own shortcomings. Uh, we don't promote democracy, human rights, the rule of law around the world because we're perfect. We promote those things because we're capable, because we do deep down believe in them and we're the only country in the world that's capable of fighting for them effectively. And I think there are still people all around the world who want us to be that force so long as we are honest uh, and humble about our own shortcomings. And I'll tell you, you know, Putin is gloating right now and uh, Xi Jinping and China's gloating right now. But, uh, you know, imagine uh, imagine this in Russia. Like, imagine that Putin loses a free and fair election and his parliament, the Duma, independently certifies the victory of his opponent, even though Putin sends a mob of thugs to try to kill the members of the Duma and they tell him, go to hell, we're still doing this. Like... That would be great. <laughs> and so as, as shameful as this is, as awful as it was, look, the good guys won here. We, we came back to the floor of the House and the Senate. We certified the election. Trump is going to be out. Uh, he's going to be in legal jeopardy, which is going to be a spectacle for the whole world, I think, and a good one. Uh, so we've got a chance, depending on how we fix this, depending on how we respond, to hold, up, hold our heads up high as a, an imperfect champion of the values that we fought for successfully in the Congress last week. Wow, I did not expect a, uh, a the system is working. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, I know, uh, I didn't either. I feel, would, feel yeah. good speech <laughs> from you. Uh, but I have to say, if you, yeah, if you look at I this from it. the vantage point of a year from now, um, in which we successfully navigate the next 10 days, um, this will not, this will be an episode that a lot of people should feel a great deal of shame over uh, and requires a lot of count accountability, but that the United States as a democracy uh, will have an interesting story to tell about, of yeah. at least of resilience. I just, I. Mike Godwin just typed in all caps in the chat, but I do actually also want to say this. Thank you so much for finishing that vote. Like I was up till 2 a.m. following um, what was going on, and I don't think it wrapped up until like between 3 and 4 in the morning. I went to bed, but I was, it really was one of those like, holy cow, if we don't, if you guys, if it, like if they actually succeed in some horrible way in shutting down this count and this vote, that will be like the real loss, like, and um, I, so, yeah, so thank thank you to all of you for like pulling pulling that through after like what had to be a terrifying day. Like, I mean, obviously it was a terrifying day after a terrifying day. So. Daniel, the floor is yours. I am wondering whether there's any appetite in Congress for tightening up the requirements about who can become president. So, for example, not allowing someone that is drowning in debt to, you know, even run for president? Uh, any of that would require changing the Constitution, I presume. And so I don't think there's much appetite for, for, for that. Definitely. You know, uh, we, we ought to be smart enough not to elect a man like Donald Trump again. And if, if we do, then there, then I don't know. Maybe, maybe we deserve what we get, but I, I don't. I don't think we will. 
uh, what happened that here, I have think. been the layer of that, like, who gets to run for president should not be the layer at which we target reform, <laughs> like, on this type of thing. It yeah, but you know, number of steps above that. So. Yeah, but look, a lot simpler, a, a much simpler solution is make make every candidate for president or vice president release their tax returns. Oh, my God. Yes, we can do that. Yes, just by passing a law. Yep. Uh, you can still run, yep. but we, yep. we got to know. And then people can that. can judge. So, um, and you know, there are a lot of reforms that we we've, we've proposed in the House. Uh, Adam Schiff has a has a bill that kind of took all of the the abuses of power that that Trump was responsible for uh, and tightened the rules against those abuses, firing inspectors general, uh, refusing to respect subpoenas from Congress, spending money that. Congress appropriated for one thing on something else, like building the wall, uh, violating the emoluments clause. We took all those things, we put them in a bill to prohibit them. And obviously the Republicans weren't gonna go for any of that while Trump was president. But you know, I, we can go now to Lindsey Graham and Mitch McConnell to say, hey guys, what do you say? We got a bill that says Joe Biden has to respect your subpoenas. What do you think? So yeah. I, I think I, I think we have a chance to pass some of these reforms, and Biden will say whatever. Yeah, I'm not going to do right. those Biden's things. So and putting them forward yeah. is like a wonderful is a wonderful statement of, of standing on principles and not politics. Yep. Alice, with the ever loud refrigerator, the floor is yeah. yours. Unfortunately, um, so I was. You mentioned briefly that Donald Trump has legal trouble that's waiting for him. Do you think? that if that wasn't there, he might be going more quietly. <laughs> I, I can't, I never imagined that he would go quietly under any circumstances. I, I just, just knowing his character. Uh, does the legal trouble weigh on him on top of all of that? Yeah, probably. And it should. Because the presidency is a kind of protection for him. You know, it's also something we haven't experienced what in America. A, a lot of he can lit the man can literally pardon himself. <laughs> like, yeah. I but mean... but I also think for him, the pieces are not that detached. He doesn't operate that rationally, where he says, "Ah, I would negotiate an exit for myself, but for the singular feature of my legal liability." There's no distinction to him between the Russia stuff and the Ukraine, the perfect phone call and the steel, stop the steal and Jim Comey yeah. and Alex Vindman and, you know, Adam Schiff, right? It's all one melange. And I, I don't, I don't think he disaggregates his emotional enemies that precisely. Yeah, I think that's right. Patricia Valentine, uh, I think this is the first time you're on the show. Welcome. It is. Thank you. And it's Valentine. Oh, Valentine. Um, thank you for telling us. Sure. Um, you mentioned that the FBI was doing investigations and maybe other agencies. Does Congress currently have an investigation scheduled and who would be doing that? That is uh, such an important question. Yeah, really we important. we. We certainly will. It's it's a little soon, and uh, Congress was sent home after we finished certifying the elections, which I I said was a mistake. I I led a letter with dozens of my colleagues to our leadership saying we got to get right back here to work on these things. Uh, so yes, there will be an investigation of the Capitol Police and the security response and what went wrong. Uh, that's that's the first thing. Uh, I am. I think we we probably need something like a 9/11 commission to look at the rise of violent extremism in our country, how it contributed to the events on Wednesday, but also just more broadly, uh, and whether we have the tools and institutions that we need, and the awareness that we need to be able to uh, address it. So, um, yeah, that that will all come. Right now, we're. You know, we're trying to get through the next few days and, and taking up the question of accountability first. 
So what does the next few days look like? Let's close on this. What uh, the the resolution will be introduced tomorrow. What happens then? What like get us walk us through a sort of prospective TikTok of today through the twentieth. So yeah, it gets uh, it gets introduced, and I think it's a very clean, simple resolution that uh, that just cites the 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 insurrection, the the incitement of an attack on the Capitol. There are a hundred other things we could put in there, but I think uh, we we should and will keep it simple because it's so simple, and because of the the absolute obviousness of what happened and his role in it, I think, uh, you know, we're not going to have hearings. We're not going to go through the, the normal process. It will go to the floor of the house. We know what happened. We have all, you know, we, we can, we have the information we need to decide yes or no. Uh, and as early as Wednesday, we could have a vote. And, and if so, that happens and it passes, then it goes to the Senate. And so you're, there has been some reporting today that the speaker is thinking of hanging on to it, uh, I guess out of acknowledgement that we're not going to, um, we're not going to remove him through a speedy Senate trial. So may as well, if it's largely for statement purposes, for deterrent purposes, and for um, to uh, for disqualification purposes, a Senate trial can wait a few weeks or months. So, you know, let Biden come in and have some legislative time first. Is, is, do you think that's likely to happen or is the urgency of the situation likely to prevail? I think there is there is a great sense of urgency among members of uh, my caucus in the House, the Democratic caucus. I don't think we want to wait to take the initial step. What comes after that is uh, remains to be seen. And has there been any discussion um, as to who will, I mean, this unlike the last time where the group of people who led the investigation of the Ukraine uh, matter were the obvious impeachment managers. Here, it's not obvious who should prosecute this. Uh, to me, you guys were all uh, victims of this. You were all, uh, the facts are quite well known. Um, has there been any discussion of who's going to prosecute this in the Senate? Uh, not, not that I've been involved in, but again, it's, uh, this just happened. And Tom Malinowski. Oh, sorry. Finish. Please finish. Yeah, I'll tell you most of the discussions among members or many of the discussions have centered on just sharing our experiences of that day, helping people through uh, the, the post-traumatic stress that, that many of my colleagues are feeling. Uh, this is, it, it's essential that we function. I've been stressing that and that we move quickly, but also recognize that there are human beings here who just went through something uh, very, very difficult. And so that, that adds hours, maybe days to, to, to work that, that, that theoretically we might have wanted to complete in 24 hours. And Representative right. Malinowski, I just wanna say like how, what a relief it is to hear that like from from an elected representative and that thank you for like you know you yourself having gone through this but like you have the strength that you have to be able to like put this forward and help others is like very uh it's profound even calling us today from the statutory room like people in the chat all day have been or for the entire show have been talking about how moving it is to see it like after everything that happened and all of the horror that they saw on their TVs for Wednesday and Thursday. And so thank you for bringing us here because this is pretty special and it's great to see it. It almost like makes me a little choked up, honestly. You're going to do like, a pirouette yeah. to close yeah, it's here? Just like, it's just like, here we go. Oh, great. We're still here. Like everything's like maybe everything's going to be okay. It's going to be a lot of work, but uh, yeah. So there really is a. Uh... That's the entrance to the, the house floor right there. 
Uh, so they came down here from the rotunda, which is that way, and um, and banged down these doors, basically, and uh, tried to break them down, and they didn't get in. Yeah. They got in the Senate. They didn't get in the House, thankfully. Right. So. Yeah. Tom Malinowski, you're a great American. It, really it pains American. me to admit it, because uh, uh, <laughs> we... we... <laughs> Um, but, you know, uh, Ben, America <laughs> will be uh, America will be healed when you and I can disagree on something again. Exactly. It's when we, that'll when, be the when, sign. You know, the last time I was in Congress with you, um, I was uh, you. Uh, we were both testifying at something, and you had Jen Daskal sitting in back of us. This was back when you were running Human Rights Watch's Jen. Washington office. And Jen was kind of one of your staffers and you, she had a very sharp pencil and you instructed her to poke me with it if I said <laughs> anything that disagreed with you. <laughs> so uh, whatever uh, it takes. Yes, we uh, we've come a long way. Um, please come back and join us. Uh, and thank you uh, for 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 chatting with us today. This was a real thank guest. you both. Thank this you was so fun. much, Representative. So, uh, Kate, who is our guest tomorrow? Uh, Jack Balkin from Yale Law School. And so he'll be joining us to talk about constitutional crisis and about deplatforming um, and digital speech. And that'll be 22 hours and 58 minutes from now. And until then, we don't have fun anymore, but we, uh, we do still have a capital in the hands of the Democratic forces both, uh, uh, and I mean that with a small d. Uh, 